Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and in prayers. Now what I just read to you is a little blurb out of a big event in the very, the very first New Testament church. And it was one of the great events of the day, of the, of the whole life of that church. God had empowered them. He told them in Acts chapter 1, you stay here and I will empower you. You'll receive power. And it happened that day. They were given great power. There was a great number of people added to that church. And then what we just read is God's assessment of the church. This was their condition at the time. God basically said, and, and here is how they were at that time on that day. Now, if we were to go over to Revelation chapters 2 and 3, we find that God speaks to seven churches, and he gives an assessment of those churches. He tells what the state of those churches are, good and bad. He tells them what they're doing right, he tells them what they're doing wrong. So, it is reasonable for us to say that God assesses his churches. And that means it is reasonable for us to, us to say this, God knows the actual condition of our church at any time. Here's a scary thought. God has evaluated our last year. And he is, has evaluated our day, where we are today as a church. How would you like that one? Um, I think since God is interested in that, we ought to be interested too. I think that's fair. Um, what I'm going to kind of do... Every year, the President of the United States gives a State of the Union address. Just in what state is our union? I mean, not like Texas, but I mean, what's the condition? Well, we're going to kind of do a State of the Church address this morning. Let's evaluate. Let's try and be as honest as we can, and let's evaluate, because I want to talk to you about both our past and maybe a little about our future, where we are, where we're going, now, I, I got to, just, just to let you know before we start, I, my temperament is not that of a visionary. I know guys that are visionaries. Uh, the good thing is they have great vision. The bad thing is they're almost never practical. So there's nothing like a super innovative visionary person because they have ideas all the time. The bad thing is only about one out of ten of them are good. But they have these, and I know, I know a guy that's a visionary. He's a great visionary, and he's always getting up and saying, and this next year, and he pronounces this stuff, and everybody that's on his staff are going, because he's not a practical. He just thinks they'll make it happen. Well, I'm more practical, but let's look at this practically, and let's throw some faith in there. All right, last year. Last year. We had some ups last year. You know, I, I, just as honest as I can be, I sit down and started kind of tooling this thing together, and I was thinking, oh, man, you know. Oh, and then I began to realize we had, we had a lot of good things happen last year. As I began to kind of plow through this, we had souls saved. What a blessing. We had people come to Jesus Christ. I think we baptized 11. I mean, there are people who have done more, but we did less, and we don't lay hands on people lightly. We had 11 people follow the Lord in scriptural baptism. We're told in verse 41, they that gladly received the word were baptized. I've always been a little curious about somebody who says, yeah, I've been born again, but I don't know about baptism. Oh, come on. You born again or not? Get on that thing. Our finances improved last year. Amen. Do you know... For the first year since I've been here, we didn't lose any money in any account. In fact, we had a little bit of a gain. 
Um, fairly healthy gains in a couple of accounts. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lord. We had several young people surrender their lives to ministry, full-time ministry. We've got three of our people in, in Bible college right now preparing for ministry. And I think we may have a couple of more in the shoot. And, and God is, let me, guys, hear me. One of the greatest feathers God can put in our cap is when he reaches in among us and calls people to go into ministry. It is a tremendous thing. And I know sometimes when we look at that, I know sometimes when I look at that, somebody comes up and says, I think God's calling me to preach, and I'm thinking, no, not you. You know, I've got a list from God to work from, but you're not on it. Uh, and don't go, but really we need to look at that with eyes of faith because God has reached in. I wonder on that first church in Acts 13 when God said, separate Paul and Barnabas to me for the work I've done. That they, I wonder if those guys went, you know those guys were carrying the load there. Look at the work God did. Now that's a blessing. We laid a good foundation for effective prayer in our church and in our personal lives. I'm not saying we've arrived because we haven't. I'm not saying we're kicking it because I'm not sure that we are. But I'm saying this, we are in so much better position than we were a year ago. It's like, I feel like the, the field is plowed and the seeds are sown and we're ready for things to pop up. We're ready to see some leaves. And, and uh, those of you who have been coming on Wednesday night know exactly what I'm talking about. We have Our prayer meeting has gone from the service of the living dead to something with some life in it. Thank you for that, Lord. And I'll tell you something else. Kind of along that line is, is we have and experienced a new awareness of the Holy Spirit in our work in a very biblical way. And, and that's a hard thing to do, but we're getting there. I mean, it wasn't a bad year. But, yeah, I knew that was coming. We did have some downs. Let me spend about 12 seconds talking about that. Actually, so we did have soul saved, we didn't have enough. And I'm saying that on a practical basis. This is not a visionary saying, we should have had 3,000 like that. I'm just saying, all things told, from who we are, how many of us there are, where we are, we should have been better, reasonably speaking. Uh, and, and here's what I'm seeing. We are becoming a little too inwardly focused, which is natural. Guys, here is our natural state. This is not our natural state. This is our natural state. We just naturally tend to want to watch out for each other and kind of set up our fortress mentality and protect our ground and go into maintenance. And uh, that's not the way God wants us to be. Um, I'm not seeing a passion for the lost and concern for our friends and families that we ought to have. I, I just don't see it. You're thinking, well, thanks, Pastor. Yeah, what is wrong with you? Okay, here's another thing. We're doing a little bit of coasting. We're just kind of coasting. Now, I kind of like to coast. I used to ride a bicycle. Now, I have a motorcycle but I used to ride a bicycle, and there was nothing like a nice long hill that you could coast in. There was one on, on a street near my house that I would sometimes get up over 40 miles an hour, and on a bicycle, that is not a good feat. And I would have to apply a little bit of brake, but I liked the coasting. We tabled in attendance. We lost some enthusiasm for our ministry. Getting workers has become a challenge. Our mission giving static. It's kind of like we have hit a level of comfort and we're just coasting. Now, I am not laying all that on you. Sounds like I am, but I'm not. This stuff tends to roll down from the pulpit, and I know that. If our church was just knocking it out of the park, 
everybody be going, wow, preacher. Well, if we're not knocking it out of the park, they ought to be saying, preacher. And I apologize for not leading better and inspiring more and challenging you because I think we are pretty happy with where we are because I'm just kind of been leaving you where you are. And if you don't hear it, you don't see it, you probably won't do it. So, I do need to say straighten up and fly right, but somebody needs to say it to me. Not right now. Don't, I don't want to hear it. forgot Deborah was going to be here today. And, and here's the thing. I'm talking about last year, and the good thing about this is last year is behind us. And there's, there's nothing we can do about it. You know, I remember seeing a, a show one time where a, a cop had been involved in a shooting and had shot someone, and uh, they, had, they were under investigation, and it was, a, it, it was a very troubling thing. And he was sitting talking to his captain in his office, and the captain said, he said, have you ever studied much about a blue whale? And he said, no not the conversation he had. And he said, you know, they're the largest creature on earth and they can only swallow something about as big as a football. And he said, yet they're, they're the largest thing on earth. And he said, okay. And then the captain said, you know why that is? And he said, no. And he said, because that's the way it is and there's nothing you can Guys, last year is the way it is, and there's nothing we can do about it. All right? It's done. Now, I know the temptation is, well, we'll just rewrite history. A lot of that goes on, isn't it? We're not going to rewrite history. That's the way it is. That's 2018. But we're not in 2018 yet. So though we can't redo it and change it, we can learn from it, can't we? So, this year, my goodness, it is not 11.30 yet. i got to tell you, we're trying to tighten this up. We may got a little too tight for you. So, I know we may let you guys early. Please don't be upset. But I'm halfway through this message. I feel pretty good about it. This year. So, what are we looking at this year? Because this one hadn't been written yet, Right? There is something that can be done about this year. So what are we going to do about this year? Well, I've been talking to you about it. Victory. We're looking for a year of victory. I, I do not have anyone in mind, but I think it is safe to say in a group this size that some of you are downright in bondage. You are oppressed. You are not living victory. If I, if I were to go around and ask people one at a time, and I wouldn't, and if you gave me an honest answer, and you probably wouldn't, some of you would say, I have never lived in spiritual victory. I have never lived in Christian victory. I would never have described myself as an overcomer. I have been overcome my whole ministry. It's been one defeat after another. It seemed like every battle I've had spiritually, I've lost. Sometimes I hold out a little longer than others, but eventually... I lose. I'm like a kid holding his breath. I may hold it a little longer this time, but I always grasp for another breath. It always gets me. I know it's not going to last. And at the, listen to me, at the end of this year, my prayer, my desire is, at the end of this year, I have some people telling me that they're living in victory. That I have some people telling me, you know what, I am overcoming. I am knowing God in a new way. God has given me this victory, this part of my life, I thought I'd never get my hands on that. And I'm living above it. I have had some of the roughest patches and God has given me more joy and power and praise and I am more alive spiritually than I've ever been. And it's not because life is smooth. And it's not because everything's going easy. And this is easy to preach, isn't it? But we can live it. We are looking for a year of victory. And if you're living it, our church will have it. We need a year of an outward look. 
Right? Boy, it would have been neat if when I'd done that, everybody here to go. We are not, as I said, experiencing the passion for people who don't know Christ as we should. Now, I'm not saying everyone here, but overall as a church. You know what? We are living the answer. And people ought to know it. Amen? We are living it. We are living the life. I'm in the fraternity of the free. If you are a born-again child of God, you, God said, I've come that you can, Jesus said this, John chapter 10, verse 10, I've come that you could have life. And then he said this, that you could live more abundantly. In other words, you could have really lived. If we said it today, I've come that you lived, that you could really live. That is not being overcome. God, give us hearts for others. Let me ask you something. Who do you know? Think about this. Who do you know that you may be the only human hope that they've got? Who do you know that you may be the only real Christian in their lives? Are you just hoping somebody will wander in? Father, this is scary. I mean, Lord. We talked in this morning in Sunday school, we finished up the book of Philippians, and we saw how Paul, who was in prison, He's writing this letter to the Ephesian church and he's in prison. And he gives them all these tools for winning the spiritual battle of life. And then he gives them these two offensive weapons. First is the word of God and the second one's prayer. And he said, stop praying. I mean, really going after it. And he said, praying for each other. And then he says this, and, and as for me, as long as we're talking about prayer, he said, pray for me also. We talked about the fact if that had been any of us in that room, we would have said this. Pray for me that I could get out of here. I didn't do anything wrong. I have not broken any laws. I'm a good man. I've been supportive of Caesar. I have prayed for him. I am, I am teaching people to be better citizens that I could get out of here. Instead, Paul say, said, pray that I would speak up and have boldness because there are people around me, I mean, where a better place to be a witness than in jail? And he said that I could, you know what? We know the record. Some of the, some of the greatest liberty some people ever experienced was being locked up with Paul because they were set free by his Savior. We need to pray for that. And one of the things we talked about is by nature we are timid about this. Some of us who are so bold are timid when it comes to talking to someone about their soul. And we need to pray for that. If Paul had to ask people to pray for him because he needed help in boldness, because Paul was kind of bold by nature. If Paul needed it, we needed it. And we ought to be praying for each other. I'm hoping this year we'll see growth. And I'm not just talking about numbers. Actually, numbers is kind of a byproduct. If we're growing in spirit, if we are growing in maturity and depth in Christ, if we're growing in spiritual power, numbers will take care of themselves. We don't have to have some kind of numbers drive or a membership drive or some kind of great campaign. People are attracted to a fire. They'll come to watch it burn. And uh, I think there are a lot of people that would like to go to a church. They just want it to be real. And, and I, I sympathize with that. Um, I was talking to someone this morning. There's been a, a studies done that a lot of people, I don't remember the numbers, so I don't want to make one up, but a lot of people who have been interviewed said that they would go to church if somebody had asked them. Now, obviously some of those people would. You know, people say, sure. And I, I was telling, when I was talking to you this morning, I, I ran into a lady at Keith's Hamburger Station. And uh, I walked in and I was wearing my, I love my church shirt. And she said, do you really? And I said, do I really what? She said, you really love your church. And I said, yes, as a matter of fact, I do. And she said, you go there? And I said, yes, as a matter of fact, I do. 
And uh, and I said, I do love my church, and it's a great church. And and Donna had a tract, and I handed it to her, and I said, you, well, you really need to come. Do you go to church here? And she said, no, but I need to. I said, I wish you'd come. And she said, oh, I will. I'll be there. I'll be there. I have talked to her twice so far, and she hadn't been here yet. Felt good to talk to her. But, and I know not everybody will, but some will. I used to play golf, allegedly. And uh, I used to play with our previous pastor a lot, Cecil Maxey. I bet I played 300 rounds of golf with Cecil Maxey, and I never beat him once, ever. I got ahead of him a time or two, and I found out something. Cecil, as nice as he was, was very competitive. And if I got ahead of him, it bothered him. When I was behind him, he'd say, oh, I'll just lay another one down, go ahead and hit. Take a mulligan. If I was ahead of him, you wouldn't get that far. And, uh, and, and I mean, it, was, it got to be kind of funny. But I hit, I hit a lot of bad shots. I was kind of like, I didn't invent the bad shot, but I perfected it. But every once in a while, I'd catch one on the sweet spot. You know, I'd, I'd, I'd be out there at, uh, at uh, Ratliff, and I'd be on that first, second, third hole, and it went over water, and it was kind of a long par three, and there were times I would lay that thing up there and put it within about five feet of the cup, and it might be one of two good shots I hit all day, but that shot would keep me coming back. That was enough, and it felt so good, and I'd look around to see who was watching, because I'd think, they think I'm the best player in the world. They have no idea. You know, they didn't all work out well. Oh, I sure felt good when one did. And if, if you start inviting people, they won't all come. Somebody will. You know, how, I'll tell you what makes people, churches grow is just people being excited and inviting people. So if you're wondering, why don't we have some kind of program? Here's the program. Get excited and invite people. Works every time. God, give us a moving of your spirit among us. That's what we're looking for. He can do it, things in us and through us that we just hadn't seen before, or at least I haven't. I don't know what you've seen. Things that we can't do ourselves. Um, we know that you can build a crowd in the church with just good old corporate strategy. They have learned how to, you follow these steps, you can build a crowd. That's not what we're looking for. We're looking for the blessing of God. And we need him, and we need him like never before. So, let's go for it this year. I mean, don't answer out loud, but when's the last time you saw God do something you couldn't do? One of the things we've been talking about a lot on Wednesday night, is I pray for it every morning. We pray for it when our, when our staff gets together every morning. We... Uh, we pray for it again on Wednesday night. We need a new parking lot. I mean, I don't need new, not another parking lot, except our parking lot is, the black top is disintegrating. We had a patch done out here a couple of years ago, and when the guy came out and I was showing him what needed to be patched because somebody had drug a big couple of gutters out through our parking lot, he said, well, let's just fix this much, he said, because this thing's at the end of lifespan. It's about to start coming apart on you. And there's no need to fix this now. And I remember thinking, well, this thing's not in bad shape. But he was not woofing. Uh, if you'll notice, there are spots that are just gravel. And, and, I, and I had a guy come out here, he looked at it, and he said, well, you're in good shape now. But he said, if you go much longer, it's going to start affecting your base, and this is going to get a lot more expensive because it is coming apart. <clears throat> so there are other things we could pray for, but we're praying for this because we need it. Now, it doesn't cost much, like $100,000. We've got about a tenth of that in our building fund. We are asking God to give us a parking lot. That's a big ask, isn't it? But not for God. $100,000 is nothing. 
But I am, we have been asking God, you know, not we could borrow that and get a good interest rate. Oh, that is so great, Lord. A lost person can do that. We're asking God to open a door where we can look and go, well, I'm afraid I don't know. There may be someone in this room that says, I got $100,000, I'll be in the market. Bless your soul. You know, God's got that money. He's going to funnel it to us. And we're asking Him for it this year. Now, for 100000 we can get this, we can get the old lot pulled off. They'll put on three inches of blacktop, completely seal it down, repaint it. And, uh, I mean, it'll be good to go. I don't know what we'll do while they're working on it, but it'll be good to go. And, and they'll make sure the base is right. It's a lot to be done. I talked to the pastor up here at Emmanuel, and they just had their sealed, and it cost them thirty thousand. It's a pretty good deal, uh, but it's still a pretty good chunk of money. But we're just asking God to do something great. Confession. I have never seen God do anything great in my ministry. I've never been in one of those things where He said, "Let me tell you about this," and everybody go, "Oh no." Have you ever heard one of those stories? You're thinking. Eh, I don't know. Did you see that? Well, no, but it happened three weeks before I got there and I heard about it. I don't want one of those. I want something that God does that I can see. God, show yourself to us. And we'll honor you for it. None of us will brag on how sharp we were. Wouldn't you love to see a big answer to prayer? Anybody here? No, not me. I I'm good. Pray for that. I want to challenge you. Pray for that. Every day. I sat in a deacon man. I said, guys, I want you praying for a new parking lot every day. If I ask you if you pray for it today, you, you either say yes or not yet. But, but it shouldn't stop there. We just ought to go for it this year. Let's have a good year. Let's quit coasting and compromising or being casual. Charles Stanley wrote a book years ago called Confronting Casual Christianity. What a great title. Well, not to be casual. Let's live it. Let's draw from God in His power. Let's just quit being lost 201. God, give us a big year. And it'll start with you. That day, there was this little group in an upper room and they were praying. And the Holy Spirit came on them. Because there's no way they did this in their own, in their own strength. And this huge outpouring came. And people were added to that church. And they just kept coming. They continued in the Apostles' Doctrine stayed in truth. And believe me, they were praying. And they broke bread, which some people believe that was the Lord's Supper. A, a lot of people just believe that they stayed close and took care of each other. And they prayed together. And God just blessed and blessed and blessed. And they didn't even have a building. In fact, no church had a building for another 200 years. How about that? They met in houses. And houses weren't very big. Wow. What we don't want is at the end of this year to look and say, boy, it's amazing how much we could accomplish without God's power on us. We don't want that, do we? And we don't have to have that. So I want I want to challenge you and pray with you and join in. Let's go. Let's go. Let's get to the end of this year and look back and just shake our heads and say, wow, but for God, that wouldn't happen. And i got to tell you, we don't have any political clout. Is there anybody in here that's like on city council or county commissioner? Judge? Mayor? 
Oh, we might have a chance. We don't have political clout. Anybody here a multimillionaire? We don't have any. We don't have financial clout. Any, anybody here a professor in a learned institute like even a junior college? We got any junior college professors? We don't have any intellectual clout. We're a little bit like that first church, aren't we? They didn't have any important people. Had a few fishermen. Had an ex-tax collector. Everybody hated his guts. Had a zealot who was basically an early day terrorist who hated Romans. He hated Rome. And Matthew worked for Rome. I always wondered if they had to separate them to move. They were not influential people. But the power of God was in them. And eventually people were saying, get those guys out of here. They're turning the world upside down. We may not can turn the world. I don't know what God will have for us. We can see things happen. So let's do that. I want you to stand.